see that um, Christian Mundigla from FACC uh, is already on the session. So uh, great, uh, hi Christian. Um, and the other speakers will come soon. Normally it would be um, Mike Hirschberg who would lead this session. Uh, probably has some uh, computer problems so he couldn't connect as it's an, again a connection from uh, um, United States from California. So I will start off the session and as soon as Mike will be here, who is a very competent moderator and knowledgeable person on electric uh, aviation, especially on eVTOLs. Uh, as soon as he comes in, I will drop out. So I, int I introduce him already here. So if you will see him popping up, that's Mike Hirschberg, our partner, and he should lead this session. Maybe he will have another session then uh, later if we cannot do this. So thank you very much. Let's go to the third session of today. Thanks to all the speakers um, of the session number two on electric propulsion. Now we're going to our session on supply chain and all different parts which are around this uh, microcosmos of electric aviation because um, having an electric aircraft, yes, that's very important, but having only an electric aircraft without the infrastructure, without the manufacturing capabilities would not help. So thank you very much for session two. And Christian, if you can try to share your screen, then I'll leave the stage to you. Christian has worked in aviation for quite a long while. He was head of the, uh, at Rotax, of the small aviation motors of uh, the Rotax company. And since several years now working for FACZ, uh, um, large manufacturer for great large airliners, and he'll tell you more about this. Christian, I see your screen. Your mic is on. The screen is yours. Hello, uh, good afternoon and good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor. Thanks for the invitation. On behalf of FACC, welcome to our world and congratulations to this uh, great event. So as uh, Willy said, I joined FSCC uh, five years ago, uh, coming from Bombardier Rotax. And uh, it's, a, it's a also an honor for me, as I just uh, have seen the presentation from Jin Yin uh, with the H3PS uh, Horizon 2020 parallel hybrid project. I was also part of that project working already uh, together with uh, my friends. It's, it's a real pleasure for me to see uh, those presentations. So FSCC is fully committed to the sky at all levels, uh, meaning we are in aviation since more than 33 years now, originally coming from a uh, ski uh, producer Fischer here in Upper Austria. I am sitting in the headquarters next to the Fischer Ski Factory. And more than 30 years ago, they had the idea to do something else uh, with lightweight composite components. And they decided to go into aviation very successfully now after 33 years. And during the COVID crisis, uh, we di discussed uh, should, what else should we do? And uh, we decided to stay committed uh, to the sky, uh, but extend our portfolio uh, to urban and advanced air mobility, but also uh, to the space. So our vision, and this is important and really true, uh, is to fulfill uh, the human desire for mobility. And this in a new and more efficient and sustainable way. And our mission is to do this by using the materials and processes of tomorrow. And it's really not just words, but it's real. So uh, we, we take all the experience from 30 years Aviation, bring it in the new uh, segments like urban air mobility. We invest a lot in new material and processes and we learn there and bring it back also to aviation again uh, to close the loop. Uh, 10 years ago, we already cut our CO2 footprint in half by using a geothermy and solar uh, photovoltaic systems. Uh, and in 2040, we want to be completely CO2 neutral uh, 
uh, during, during our production. Uh, and uh, another proof that this is serious to us is our latest campaign during the Christmas party. We launched uh, our electric carpool um, project. So we give away free of charge either four for four passengers electric cars or for seven electric buses to our employees to to come uh, into work from their home uh, they can charge it free of charge um, at the factory with solar power and also can use uh, the electric cars or buses uh, free of charge uh, during the weekends so this was uh, highly appreciated it was a, a big bang during the christmas party so we are active in uh, six areas. Uh, in principle, we have three divisions, aerostructure, engine, nacelles, and uh, cabin interiors. Uh, new is aftermarket. I joined FSCC five years ago. Uh, space and advanced air mobility is around of the same age. And I'm responsible for the aftermarket and also for the yeah, mobility segment. Uh, you see here our 13, uh, locations uh, globally, our footprints. Our headquarter is in Austria, uh, but we have uh, 12 more locations. In the aftermarket, there's Montreal, uh, Wichita, and Melbourne, Florida, new site, and of course, Austria, where we offer repair, refurbish, and replace, meaning spare parts. But we also have engineering centers in India, and in, in China and Shanghai, and all over the world, wherever our customers need us to be. Uh, you can see our uh, five factories in Austria, plant one at the headquarters in Ried, uh, doing aerostructures and uh, engine components, uh, plant two uh, in Ort uh, interior, plant three aerostructure also in Ort, and uh, plant four in Reichersberg is for thrust reverses A350 and 787. Plant five is also in Ort, which is more or less an office building for purchasing a department and program engineers. Uh, and the latest factory was opened uh, last year in uh, Croatia, uh, mainly for interior, but also for aerostructure. Whatever we invest in a uh, new uh, production uh, processes, we want to use robots and automated processes in order to increase the output and uh, increase the efficiency. Um, so we invest, as I mentioned already, new processes like RTM uh, during production, but also uh, in new uh, non-destructive testing uh, processes like the thermography. So, of course, you need a lean management system and uh, a lean assembly and optimized value streams and advanced logistics. In all our projects, except one, we are 100 percent single source to our customers um, so our customers trust in us and this is good uh, in a nutshell uh, we have 3,000 employees and uh, we are 100 percent in aerospace around 500 uh, million dollar revenue last year and uh, close to 400 patents and we try to be uh, not only tier one supplier but uh, technology partner to our customers. We have close to $6 billion uh, order backlog, which is a good thing. And um, uh, we are on 13 locations, as mentioned already, globally, and we're working in advanced air mobility, aviation, and space. We are a public company by FSCC shares on the Vienna stock market. Our main shareholder is Avic Cabin Systems with 55.5%. Uh, we offer uh, whatever our customer is asking from us, ideally from the very beginning of the an idea of a new uh, project or component uh, along our value chain uh, during the entire life cycle. Uh, but we can also offer customized uh, steps out of this uh, value chain and sometimes customers are asking us for a design review or support on certification. And then they uh, learn, uh, learn about FSCC more and decide to stick together with us, which is also a good 
a thing. Uh, we are a design organization, EASA Part 21J approved, a production organization, EASA Part 21G approved, and also a maintenance organization, EASA Part 145, um, but also FAA, TCCA, CAAC, meaning the Chinese authority approved us in 2019, and uh, this year also CAA in UK. Uh, our strategy is uh, from less complex components to uh, complete uh, systems uh, to become a, a partner and a development partner for complete uh, systems and system integrator, like an empennage, for example. Um, you can see our reference, uh, our customer list, uh, long-term relationships since more than 30 years. Um, Airbus is our biggest one, our latest customers, uh, uh, Ihang, Archer, and uh, Ariane, Ariane in the space. Here we produce the kick stage of the Ariane 6 uh, rocket carrying the satellite, the, the, the engine itself, and the four tanks. Uh, we get uh, rewards and awards uh, from our customers for best performance and uh, um, leading employers or best practice from all significant customers. And uh, as you know, innovation safety is first. Uh, we are very proud of our certificates and processes when it comes to quality. And we are especially proud about our 9110 um, maintenance uh, certificate for all five maintenance locations worldwide which enables us to become a partner uh, in the repair network of our OEM customers. When we talk about advanced air mobility in detail now, uh, uh, we also want to become a technology partner and tier one supplier in, in this new portfolio uh, with a balanced broad customer and product portfolio. And of course, with aftermarket services as well. Uh, even if those numbers from Roland Berger are not uh, valid anymore and uh, the expected potential market is much higher, uh, we just want to say we want to focus on the hardware producing of complete uh, vehicles or components, but also in the maintenance, so in other services. Um, the market is driven from Asia Pacific, followed by Amer the Americas, and of course, Europe. Uh, you know better all the possible applications. Um, we at the moment focus in Austria on medical to support me medical applications because uh, medical applications uh, will show and demonstrate uh, the population that this uh, new segment is uh, reliable and uh, is a, like a lighthouse project. So last year we flew uh, blood with a Ihang Falcon cargo drone um, around five kilometers distance uh, beyond visual line of sight here in Austria, for example. And we also uh, went into a cooperation with uh, the hospital here in the town Ried to transport medical and other urgent uh, stuff within the hospital area. Uh, our first customer um, since 2017 is uh, Ihang, thanks to Ihang, trusting in um, FSCC. Here we, we received electric engines, the batteries, flight control units, but all the rest, aerostructure and interior is coming from FSCC, including uh, the final assembly here in Austria. Uh, Archer is our second um, customer and we do here uh, fuselage components and interior uh, in, in the area of the wing, secondary bonding of composites uh, and interior as mentioned already. Uh, when we talk about research and development, as mentioned at the beginning, we focus on new materials and new processes in prototype development uh, and automated manufacturing and as mentioned already in the new inspection technologies and new generation of composite structures 
in 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 a nutshell we want to make aviation safer greener and more efficient and uh, coming from the duroplast going into thermoplast you know the thermoplasts are uh, recyclable at the end of the product life cycle but also during the production uh, of the component itself uh, one example uh, in 2018 fscc already displayed sidewall panels for um, a320 interior sidewall uh, produced out of uh, bio uh, glass fiber using polyphosphoryl alcohol uh, and if you if you cure that in the autoclave the factory is smelling like a candy store like a caramel so it's uh, smelling very good and there are no disadvantages in the stress and of course it's uh, renewable when you look where we come from uh, aviation production up to 700 aircraft per year for example we manufacture up to 65 uh, floor to floor and overhead storage compartments for a320 meaning up to 3.5 ship sets per day um, uh, so we are used to quite high output but when we talk about uh, advanced air mobility the output in the future and the demands are much higher it's not like in the automotive area up to 800,000 but something between up to whatever 25,000 to 30,000 uh, components per year or vehicles per year even and this means we need to look for fast curing resin systems to achieve a high rate production uh, high performance and low cost material in focus of course um, if we if we tell that using an air taxi shall be at the same cost of a standard taxi uh, then we need to bring the cost down dramatically uh, so this is the motivation for us low curing temperatures uh, compared to aerospace material um, and out of autoclave processes and please think if if you use uh, fast curing prepacks that cure in 10 percent of the original time this means also that we save not only 90 percent of the time but also 90 percent of the energy um, when it comes to thermoset and thermoplastic, we investigate in heavily in fast curing resin systems like thermos, thermoset material uh, qualified for fast curing resin systems is needed and fast performing needed, of, of course. Stem performing for uh, less integration using unidirectional tapes. And uh, when it comes to hybrid molding, um, using a uh, rib interface quality as it uh, for thermoplastic rib interface quality is a challenge of course uh, here you can see our uh, research press for thermoset and thermoplastic uh, but we have three big ones for production already in process so when it comes to thermoset processing uh, some uh, details we are using here at the Solvay double tfagma patent and uh, on the right top corner you see a uh, how it look, how a um, spoiler of a 787 or a A350 can look like in the future, uh, produced out of three parts and pressed together in less than 10 minutes, for example. Um, and on the RTM, we are very experienced using since many years for the center hinge fittings uh, of those uh, spoilers for the A350 and 787, where we are single source. And using that uh, RTM method, um, uh, we reduced uh, the weight by two thirds uh, using that RTM um, technology. Here we come to a tuck time less than 30 minutes. On the thermoplastic side, uh, as mentioned, uh, recycling also during the production uh, possible from the tape. Uh, either in raw material or tailored blank to the component uh, like a press or autoclave manufactured and up to the assembled component here uh, we applied for a FSCC patent on a special kind of welding uh, we work closely together with uh, uh, universities like uh, Linz Institute of Technology uh, so working together means uh, money from FSCC and thermoblast capabilities in return, which we can use uh, for small 
zero production immediately. Uh, but we also cooperate uh, with other um, research um, locations, and we are also a founder member of Air Labs, holding 18% of Air Labs, aeronautical in innovate, innovation research laboratories in Austria since two years. And uh, we are implementing up to five uh, test flight areas. One is already approved by the ministry uh, close to Vienna, a very large area. And uh, uh, one, another one is quite close uh, to our headquarter. We call it the FSCC Werkswiese, meaning uh, FSCC uh, grass uh, next to our plant number four. Uh, and we invite all our new customers to use uh, all the five test flight areas um, because it's all about accelerating the speed in development of the urban and advanced air mobility technology. So why are we a perfect fit for that new segment? We are used to high rate experience from the A320 wind production. Uh, we are more than 30 years in aerospace. Uh, beside Arch and Ehang, we have two, two more undisclosed uh, OEM customers are quite experienced already. And um, we have the ability supporting uh, also the certification in EASA and somewhere in the world. Um, so exploring new paths together, HL flexible and experienced uh, from detailed design uh, to aftermarket, you see the contacts or uh, Willie really can provide also my contact. <laughs> answer session later on thank you very much christian and uh, like always very interesting and i think one of the most interesting thing here with the company facc is that we heard about that some of the large turbine manufacturers looking at electric aviation and at this new ev tall market uh, but also the people who do the composites uh, and if you see facc uh, it's coming from, uh, you know, they, they always were in kind of transport because it's Fisher Aeronautics. Uh, so it's the base was actually skis. So we see that it's really uh, getting on. We had a change of schedule because uh, Florian Holzapel can only speak a little bit later. Uh, Corwin, are you ready already to present? I'm ready to present, yes. Perfect. That's great. So uh, thank you, Christian. And our next speaker is um, Corwin Huber from the company uh, Skyroads. And this is a totally different thing again, but also very important for getting uh, aviation, electric, and especially eVTOL aviation in a lot higher quantity somehow integrated in our airspace. We'll have another session tomorrow where we'll talk about test centers and about EASA certification. But one thing which Corbin's company is covering is the air traffic control. Because one thing is clear, if you have perhaps unmanned or even hundreds of manned eVTOLs, there will be no controller who can handle 
this kind of this mass of transport so there must be new solutions like for the aircraft control so stage is your Corwin, you're a long time in aviation and the rest you will tell yourself thank you right uh, really i'm going to start a video right. now can you please tell me whether the audio is working yes uh, no it's not working but um if you have to unshare the screen again and then there is a little click button at the at the bottom side of the screen which says share audio if you, i think you have to unshare again uh, we had this uh, issue sometimes so if you unshare that uh, screen is totally away and then you share again and then before you select the screen there is at the bottom left there is a uh, share audio got it okay this is bill now he is driving is in the middle of nowhere you have to go full screen mode and you know why you're not full screen because mode. there is a road yes now it is soon this will change this is bill he is driving in the middle of nowhere and you know why because there is a road there is a road soon this will change because he'll be flying our mobility will change significantly in the near future man drone flights will play a key role in moving traffic off the road and into the sky the year 2021 was a record year for future air mobility with 7 billion dollars there is a doubling of the amount over the past decade Five companies went public with a combined market capitalization of 10 billion dollars. The industry received orders for approximately 7000 aircraft worth 26 billion dollars. And, do you know where all these future aircraft will fly? On roads in the sky. For these investments to pay us to pay off, we need technology-based systems that regulate air traffic for urban air vehicles. That's what we do. Sky roads, we're building the roads in the sky. Safe, scalable and profitable. This change will be groundbreaking. Join us on our journey. Hey Bill, hey Bill, we're building gates. Fly with us. Our sky has no limit. Sky roads. The higher Broadway. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Corbin Huber. I'm the CEO of Skyroads. And as you may have guessed from the video that we just saw, um, we are in the business of creating infrastructure for um, the upcoming urban air mobility. Um, Billy, can, we, uh, can you see my screen I, I see the screen but no i see full screen mode i don't see just the presentation window so if you go yeah now it's better now it's uh full screen all right thank you so um basically what we would like to offer uh, the aviation market in the next years is um a is autonomy as a service. Uh, what does this mean in detail? Let's have a quick look at where we stand today. Um, we are all aware of the fact that in order to manage a large number of air vehicles in the sky uh, in the next years, um, we will need a, a digital system that is up to the task. Um, air traffic control as we know it today will not be able um, to manage and scale appropriately. Um, 
interaction uh, between aircraft and the ground today is largely by a voice channel between the ground controller and the pilot of the aircraft and this will not um, be will not support the numbers of vehicles we're looking at and in particular it will also not um, support the type of four-dimensional navigation that we're looking at i.e navigation where time plays a significant factor um, the Closing speeds of vehicles uh, will make for um, reaction times that are not supported by today's aviation system, and we need something new. And fundamentally, this is what our startup um, is working on. Skyroads has been around for the last four years, and in the meantime, we have developed and flown a prototype system that fulfills a number of um, quite central functions. Um, the in the in the end uh, development of what we're doing we intend to provide safe flight automation to all operators different all different use cases and eventually enabling pilot less on demand and efficient operations at the same time we're proud of the fact that we are supporting piloted operations as long as they are required we will lower cost for vehicle operations because we are basing our system on shared infrastructure, so largely ground-based infrastructure and central guidance, which will reduce um, the um, burden on the vehicles, the, the intelligence and sensors that need to be on a vehicle. Um, we will manage traffic um, between different operators and coordinate with legacy air traffic control and at the same time offer a data and service platform that can be used by operators and third parties to enrich the environment that we'll be working in. The data services and, and commercial services can be used on the basis of our communi communication platform. So in essence, what are we doing? We are making sure that there will be reliable communication between ground and aircraft this is not a simple proposition. Uh, most of you will be aware of the fact that data communication in today's aviation has limits uh, where um, design assurance, uh, reliability, and um, um, safety is concerned. Um, we are overcoming this by um, putting smart edge computing on both edge, edges of the, on both sides of the high frequency communication that allows us to um, safely share information between a ground guidance system and the aircraft reliably. Um, so essentially what our system achieves is that we offer a piece of onboard avionics that will consistently provide a 4D command chain um, to the aircraft specific flight control computer, no matter what the status of the actual high frequency communication is. So we can bridge by, by applying the well-known um, method of system-wide information management, we can ensure that we provide consistent flight guidance to the air vehicle through um, the communication system that we are proposing. And based on that communication, um, we are um, adding functionalities such as um, traffic um, planning, traffic optimization, um, guidance by dedicated 4D vectoring for aircraft that is then again um, supplied to the vehicles from our piece of avionics into the flight um, control computer of the vehicle. And we provide for um, the um, emergency procedures, contingency management that is required in case um, environmental data change or uh, vehicles have performance issues. Um, so basically the, the service that we're offering is um, autonomy, um, or the potential for autonomy um, into vehicle operations. Um, essentially, we're calling this a safety as a service, um, and we can base 
um, and anything as a service on top of our platform because our communication provides for reliable vehicle to ground communication in um, in uh, cargo or um, working drones that could mean um, telemetry and data communication between onboard sensors and the ground dedicated uh, customer specific onboard sensors in an uh, in a um, passenger carrying environment this might mean um, uh, services for passengers, voice communication with ground personnel, um, and other types of um, data exchange with the vehicle. Um, interestingly, um, a company like ours that is providing infrastructure needs to show um, to the world at large that there is a pathway into um, a um, into a vision that is five, six, seven years out. If you were to build um, an infrastructure that is only applicable as of 28, 29, 30 onwards, um, it is very hard to fund development. And we have been very um, fortunate to be able to identify opportunities to apply our um, air vehicle management system at earlier points in time. Um, we are under contract to develop a system that will um, manage um, a medium number of heavy TV camera drones around um, fast moving sporting events. Um, our launch customer is SailGP, um, a, an international um, race, sail racing event um, who have pledged to become carbon neutral in a few years and uh, they uh, have targeted replacing helicopters, TV helicopters with drones, which need to be managed, um, especially if you want to operate several heavy drones in very confined airspace at the same time. We're building a management system uh, for this application and moving into um, commercial cargo and um, surveillance operations from there. And finally, into the manned um, sphere of our industry. Um, we have so far um, built a working prototype that has been performing very nicely. Um, we are currently equipping an airfield in the Munich metro region in southern Germany uh, with our infrastructure to prove that we can operate um, with different types of vehicles simultaneously in the air um, we have been able to put together a very nice group of contributors who are helping us to test the system. And we will be rolling out our system as of um, end of this year, uh, excuse me, coming year 2023 and expanding in the coming years. So we are proud to be part of the community that is providing the backbone or the infrastructure for all this exciting new transport that is coming up. But he's, he's and we are we will uh, we are invite all of you to get in touch with us okay. and talk to us about your requirements and what we can do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well, um, Corbin. And uh, thanks. Uh, I know you were in a traffic jam. <laughs> just arriving at the office, which is exactly the reason why we need uh, urban air traffic, uh, that we, you could do the, uh, the trip between Munich and Augsburg in an eVTOL, and then you would have been uh, without any stress. Genau. So, uh, ganz kurz, ich muss jetzt kein Witz, ich muss jetzt in China über Zoom einen Vortrag halten. Um, ist es okay, um, wenn wir in einer halben Stunde mal telefonieren, weil jetzt komme ich jetzt Ja, wir hören gerade Florian. <laughs> uh, hi Florian, uh, perfect. Uh, you have to unmute him. Um, okay, perfect. So we're just in time. We're really doing just in time delivery. Uh, so Florian, uh, I think uh, you know the procedure. You can share your screen and the stage is yours. So hi. the screen, uh, screen should be shared and I think uh, Corbin or speaking in, uh, can you hear me? Everything yes, we works? hear you fine and we sh see your screen. Perfect. So I thank Corbin yes, for- Yes, we hear you fine and we sh Perfect. see your screen. Thank you, Corbin, for taking my slot because the funny thing is because by the Ministry of Education, both presentations would have on the second 
started exactly the same time. So thank you for your flexibility. Started, thank you for your flexibility. And uh, so in the pro to talk about uh, simulation and control, and this is what I do. But of course, I want to um, present a different aspect every year. And so this time we are talking about evaluating the handling qualities um, using um, mission task element tests and a different aspect of uh, vehicle systems. So as uh, just one very brief slide about my institute, because we did a lot of wingborne and multi-copter flight controls, it's clear that you also start to do transition aircraft. And if you do transition uh, drones and on the other side, uh, basically certification and safety aspects, the way towards uh, manned uh, EVTOLs is very close. And so our typical areas which we cover are modeling, simulation, system identification, uh, ground test uh, for components, redundancy management, safety analysis, and then the flight control algorithms for the nominal and for the emergency case. And of course, if you want to integrate the stuff, you need to do hardware in the loop simulations, aircraft in the loop simulations, and then also liaise with the agency um, when it comes to certification aspects. And so as I'm not allowed to show the big, um, EV toys with which we are already flying. I can show a video uh, where we are currently flying with another 600 kilogram uh, helicopter here. Um, it's electrically driven for this test here. It's still in the test trick and we will fly uh, freely with this helicopter starting maybe February or March uh, next year. But uh, just like this, this is a placeholder. We are also already doing currently fly tests with the 600 kilogram EVTOL. And uh, we hope uh, also next year um, to do a fly test together with the company on a more than two ton EVTOL. But now for the presentation of today, um, the question is basically, how can we validate a very early that uh, different behavior schemes we want to achieve by the flight control system of an EVTOL will meet the requirements in terms of handling qualities. And so it's quite a consensus in the community that the so-called mission task elements uh, will be an appropriate way later for the uh, built EVTOLs to check the handling qualities. And uh, the SCV toll contains uh, the modified HQRM method, which tells you under which condition, including turbulences, and failure conditions, you have to achieve which levels of handling qualities. And therefore, we build behavioral models. And then with these behavioral models, we do simulated uh, pilot in the loop uh, MTE tests to find out if certain uh, behavior types are correct or not. And so as EVTOL configurations, we are not allowed to show you the ones we are really working on. So uh, basically as conceptual ones, uh, I took other photos. We take lift and cruise configurations, which have separated hover and uh, traction propulsion systems. This is basically the domain of EVTOLs we specialized on. And our operation concept is simplified vehicle operations, meaning that the pilots specify very high level commands. In the nominal control law, you have uh, velocity commands using two side sticks. One side stick uh, in hover, commanding the relative velocity to the ground. So horizontal velocity, and when you push it further forward, it becomes an airspeed. And the other stick uh, commands uh, the vertical speed and the coordinated turn rate. These high level commands make it very easy for pilots to fly. So the hope is to eventually lower the required qualification, but still the question is, are we fit to meet the handling qualities requirements? And uh, for taking the appropriate handling qualities, the core which we used is the ADS-33, which provides handling qualities for helicopters in hover. And already in the ADS-33, the concept of mission task elements is already very pronounced. And uh, in the end, basically what you get is you get certain flying tasks. And these flying tasks are more representative of what people have to do during missions than uh, if you just have uh, 
yeah, clinical inputs like steps or something like this. And so you try basically um, to have the pilot fly these uh, tasks and then you make two types of evaluation. You make a qualitative evaluation where you take the rating by the pilot, but you also do a quantitative evaluation where you're judging um, the speed of the pilot in achieving a certain objective and uh, the numerical accuracy in uh, satisfying the requirement. And once again, we have to do this with and without disturbances and with and without failures. Mm -hmm. And the two performance level we are interested in is the satisfactory um, performance, which corresponds to levels one to three on the Cooper Harper scale or level one handling qualities in the middle F8785C 87, and the adequate performance which corresponds to level two ending qualities in the middle or um, the levels four to six on the Cooper Harper uh, rating, scale, uh, rating scale. And so the types of uh, mission task elements we used, we have uh, hover and low speed MTEs, single axis mission tasks and multi-axis uh, maneuvers. Then what of course you don't find in the ADS 33, we developed own transition and uh, retransition uh, mission task elements. The airborne uh, world, uh, the wingborne world normally didn't use uh, mission task elements too much in the past. There basically we developed some which are based on uh, flight path tracking using the head-up display. And so, as I already mentioned, uh, therefore, the source is either the ADS-33, then uh, drafts of new MTEs, which are mainly discussed in the working group 112, subgroup 4 of EuroCAE, where it's about uh, VTOL, flight control handling qualities. And of course, we also make uh, own suggestions. And as visualization environment, we just use explain. We started with virtual reality. And in the end, you will see that now we're working also with uh, mixed reality. So here, just as some impressions. Um, on the left side, you would see a single task uh, MTE, where it's just about the vertical steps, where as fast as possible, you have to get to another altitude and then without overshoot, basically maintain the altitude so that the yellow area is exactly in front of you um, to have a satisfactory performance or basically the red box to have adequate performance. A more complicated one would be the period, period where you have a sidewards velocity for the period. I will show you a video later. And this is definitely a multi-axis task because you have to maintain heading, the path over the ground and uh, the altitude. For high gain tracking tasks, um, we just put crosses in the air, which are changing the position. And then um, the requirement is to get to the center of the cross as fast as possible and then maintain the position within the cross. Of course, um, when you do piloted testing, you do this from a pilot's point of view, but for the visualization, it's easier to show it like this. And by provoking these high gain tracking tasks, of course, you want to provoke pilot induced oscillations because you want to find out is the bandwidth of the controller sufficient? And on the other side, are we prone to PROs or not. By the way, this vehicle here does not make any sense at all. We just use something very generic to not uh, violate any non-disclosure agreements. Then for transition and retransition, um, we develop MTOs, which are um, MTEs, which are based on the um, volumes which have been published in the acceptable means of compliance uh, for the SCV toll by EASA where basically these maneuvers can be tested and trained and uh, be evaluated. And for the wingborne flying, as I already addressed, we are doing a path angle tracking for both the course and the climb angle. And to display this, basically, we implemented uh, it as uh, displays in the head-up display, where you see the desired reference and the actual plant performance. And of course, um, the task objective of the pilot is to keep the actual flight path marker as close as possible to the desired reference. We did uh, two test campaigns. One where we compared the nominal conditions 
with disturbances without any failures. And in the second campaign, we were always flying in disturbed air where we compared uh, the nominal condition uh, to failure condition uh, where you had a total loss in one of the um, lift thrust units. We had four pilots with different uh, flying backgrounds. For the atmospheric disturbances, it was continuous winds, one minus cosine gusts and Dryden turbulence. And for the evaluation as already um, addressed, qualitative evaluation using the Cooper Harper rating and quantitative uh, evaluation using accuracy metrics. The simulator setup uh, in the beginning was the use of two side sticks and virtual reality glasses. And so to give you an impression, so that is because we did these uh, tests already in, in uh, spring. These were the tests in spring back then. We didn't have a nice uh, eVTOL simulator yet. So we took a helicopter cockpit, but of course the dynamics was already the eVTOL dynamics. And so you see here, the task is to accurately follow uh, basically um, here for the period, this track on the ground while simultaneously always pointing the nose exactly um, to the circle in the middle and while also maintaining exactly the altitude uh, in the yellow band for the desired performance. And so the heads you see on the ground are the limits for the desired and adequate performance in the accuracy of following the maneuver. So here you see our very preliminary simulator setup, which we still had in spring. And so um, to already get to the um, summary, what we found out is, so uh, for the system we developed, um, we reached uh, average handling quality ratings of satisfactory um, in the case where we have no disturbances, but basically one of the outcome was that uh, it deteriorated quite a lot uh, for the transition. MTEs where the disturbances had a much bigger impact uh, uh, when we, uh, as we expected. This was the qualitative results for the first campaign on the, on the quantitative uh, basis. Um, the uh, results uh, for the hover were quite consistent to the qualitative evaluations and also independent of the atmospheric disturbances. So in transition, uh, finally, the qualitative and the quantitative observation um, were quite consistent. And in total, the quantitative results tended to be slightly worse than the qualitative evaluations. But here, for example, it clearly uncovered that additional uh, effort is needed um, for looking at the handling qualities through the transition phase. For the disturbances with and without the failures, it was a similar campaign. However, basically, um, we now also injected the single lift thrust unit failures. And uh, so the main uh, come, uh, outcome of this was not to read through all the results that uh, we had a significant reduction of the handling qualities um, in all types of MTEs, especially also um, for the transition and even in the wingborne case with the traction engine, um, if we had propeller failures. And so this again strongly advocates that more uh, effort has to be taken to assess the handling qualities in those phases of flight. Of course, you've seen that from the infrastructure we used, it was a very preliminary setup. And this is why over the last uh, three months, we developed a mixed reality full flight simulator for eVTOLs. Currently, we have a quite small hex support. We will replace it by a much higher amplitude uh, motion base in the first quarter of next year. And the other big thing is here that we don't use virtual, but mixed reality, where if you look in the cockpit, you will directly see basically the cockpit displays um, in the full high resolution. And as soon as you look outside the edges of the instrument board, um, then you see the real world. And so um, within only three uh, months from having the idea and not having dedicated funding for it. So a lot of things were done by people working over the weekends. And a lot of costs were covered by um, researchers doing slavery services for other companies. 
um, we could basically um, build the initial version of the simulator and take it into the operation. And in the meantime, test pilots from different uh, air taxi companies and also EASA's chief test pilot for the EV tolls could already fly in the simulator. And so what are now the conclusions from um, the research we did here? So the qualitative rating tended to be better than the quantitative one. The hover um, was, which I didn't really expect too much, satisfactory, independent of disturbances. Um, the disturbances really um, cause trouble for the transition. And um, so the main issue is that in transition, we plan from kinematic variables controlling the position and velocity with respect to the ground into aerodynamic variables as a dynamic um, pressure building up. And this made it more difficult to track ground-based uh, references. So we have to have a look in this. And if we compare the case without failures to the case with failures, then um, we saw that uh, things worked quite nice in hover. And uh, also during transition, we saw degradation in the performance, but it was still okay. And so this of course very much depends on how well your control allocation is compensating the failure. So how much is uh, your control bandwidth reduced? Possible uh, improvements for the future. So uh, basically we have to take more time for the less trained pilots to make them uh, acquainted basically with the evaluation method. And uh, we need to better account for training effects, which means that maybe we do more training with the pilots before we do the actual uh, tasks. In the future, we will incorporate additional failure conditions control surface actuator failures, battery failures, and also uh, not only losses, but also partial loss, degradation, oscillatory failure cases, or hard overs. And uh, basically, um, currently we mainly analyze the nominal behavior. We also want to check um, the backup and emergency flight control loss, how they perform under those conditions. That already uh, concludes my brief talk about assessing handling quality requirements for EVTOLs using mission task elements, again, with the focus to do it before you actually fly the aircraft, because then you can be sure that a certain dynamics really meets the requirements. And so you can already select your components of your vehicle, your motors, your propellers and everything in a way so that you make sure that a satisfactory or adequate uh, performance will be achieved. If you would only do these studies later during flight testing and you see that you fall short of certain requirements which are not uh, covered by the physics of your actual vehicle, the changes would be very expensive. Thank you very much for your attention and um, as every year, it's a pleasure for me to talk in this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. And like, as every year, you have something interesting new, which is uh, really at the pulse of what is happening. Because I think as a lot of aircraft getting ready, simulators is something which can help in two things. One, to experience how the flying could be. And the second, also to have the public acceptance for this kind of aviation. So now we come to the last speaker of these sessions, but I ask you, I hope you can have the time to stay until the final discussion we have at the end. Um, Uli Emes from uh, Theon. Um, it's something we had like composite parts, we had uh, like the air traffic system, we had simulators. Now we have one thing, which is a very important part of the supply chain, the battery. So I had uh, Uli this year for the first time at Aero and I was really interested and fascinated from what they were telling. Um, we are really looking forward to getting your, ba your batteries airborne. So Uli, if you share your screen, um, I will unmute myself. I think you're unmuted, yes.
Yes. <clears throat> Can you see my screen now? Yes, I see the screen, but it's not in present. Now it's in presentation mode. And I oh, excellent. <clears throat> Thank you. Good. Thank Bye. you, Willy, for the for the invitation to this uh, audience, and hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Uli Emes. I'm the CEO of uh, Theon, a German startup for lithium sulfur batteries. And I would like to uh, show you um, our technology. Let me first start with a bit of information about the battery industry itself. 70% um, of the battery cost is material cost. And 50% of this cost is cathode material. That means it makes a lot of sense to work on cathode materials to bring cost down and performance up. And this is exactly what our co-founder Marek Slavik started 10 years ago already with lithium sulfur battery technology. The second thing is the battery industry likes drop in new technologies. They have invested a lot and they don't want to change too much. So we can drop in our technology and save a lot of energy <clears throat> and having a, a much lower CO2 footprint. But we will see that now in detail. Let's have a, a look to the market in, in general. So we have currently a demand of 800 gigawatt hours of storage capacity in all segments. And this is expected to be tenfold by 2030 to over eight terawatt hours. And the reddish curve is production capacity is lagging behind. So this is a fantastic field for us as a startup in the battery field. The very, very complicated thing for the gigafactors which are planned right now is the availability of raw materials because there's six times more demand for materials than there is availability. But we don't use this material. We don't use cobalt or nickel. We, yes, we, do, we use lithium, but we only need 150 gram per kilowatt hours. So, and the solution for that situation is sulfur. And the reason why we are called Sion is that this is the archaic Creek name for sulfur. So it makes a lot of sense. It's not Sion, it's Sion. So sulfur is a material which is abundantly available everywhere where you have petrochemical industry or plastic industry you need they need to get rid of sulfur so there are mountains everywhere in the world democratically very well disputed where you can find um, sulfur and for this material cathode material no mining is required compared to nmc811 for example with nickel manganese and cobalt and now from a cost perspective it's even more interesting beside the availability we pay only 20 cents per kg compared to 20 euros per kg for standard high energy density NMC cathode material. So we can say check on the cost side, remembering 50% of the material cost is cathode material. But there is another strong argument for sulfur. This is the super high energy density, and this is measured in milliampere hours per gram. And if we compare that now to iron phosphate or the the NMC's cathode materials, we are far be beyond 1,000 milliampere hours per gram. So abundantly available, cheap, high energy density. Why nobody is using sulfur? Ah, that is the point, because where is a, light of, a lot of light, there's also a lot of shadow. And the problem with sulfur is cycle life. But we found a solution for that. So, But let's put this material into a cell. And that means that we, we, our target is to achieve a three times higher gravimetric energy density compared to state of the art. Today's state of the art is 300 watt hours per kg. But we have established a roadmap with improvement on cathode side, electrolyte, and anode side to reach 1000 watt hours and to bring the cost down uh, by factor three to, to 35 euros per kilowatt hours because of this cheap material. Our first commercial cells, we, we are targeting 500 watt hours per kg and 500 cycles. We have a very low footprint in the cell production processes, which is important. And as we have a very lean bill of material, it's easy to recycle our, our uh, cells. So now put, put these high energy density material uh, batteries into a product. What does it mean? It means we, we only need to charge our cell phone every three days. We can drive more than 1,000 kilometers per charge, but very importantly for the for the EV12 is that we can easily drive more than two hours, and then it becomes really a game changer for the electric flight industry. So how we do it? And now let's let's talk a bit about the shadow of sulfur. There are two issues uh, of sulfur. The first is 
when we charge in districts, they are, they are building polysulfide shuttles. And these shuttles, these um, um, they are corroding the cathode, and then normally after 30 cycles, the cell is dead. The second problem is when we charge lithium ions into the cathode, there is a volumetric expansion by over 70%. But nobody wants to have a cell which which is freezing. So, so for for these are the big problems. Therefore, current slurry based lithium sulfur battery technology is not really promising. And in large scale, uh, lithium sulfur cells are not not available. But there is a huge potential. Therefore, it makes sense to think disruptively for solutions. And I will show you. How we process the sulfur in order to come to this high energy cathode. So what we are doing is we melting down sulfur at 125 degrees, then we spray a very thin layer of carbon nanotubes on top of this, less than 1% weight percent, highly conductive for heat and currents. And then we apply 60,000 volts and all this particle getting a light like, like nanowires on top of the molten sulfur. And then we crystallize the the sulfur around these carbon nanotubes. And this is a self-standing cathode made out of crystals without any binder and a very, very high active material content. And this is the base for our cathode. Then we take that out and we dip coat it in a very special material, but cheap material, in order to protect the surface against these polysulfide shuttles, so avoid corrosion. This material is then cross-linked with a special irradiation process. Then we cut it um, uh, to the size of our electrode we need in the cell. And then we add a catholyte, which is very beneficial for the cycle life as well, and helps to extend the cycle life together with the, with the anode. The last step, and from now on, it's state of the art, because then it is the stacking process. We add a lithium metal anode, uh, together with our lithium, with our sulfur crystal cathode. And these monocells are then stacked to the number of layers we need for the application. So it's four to eight layers in a small pouch and for portable cell phones, or it's up to 40 layers, 40 monocells in a in a in a in a pouch cell or a hard case prismatic cells for EV application or flight applications. So we can drop in this technology into an existing cell assembly line. So we just need to remove the slurry coating process of the cathode and to introduce on the anode side the lithium metal anode. And, and then from th this moment on, all the existing processes installed in the factory can be used and transformed to a very much higher energy density. So. There is a, it's, a, it's a huge or a big field of innovation we have brought into this technology. It's, it's 22 and seven of uh, we have now patented or are in the filing process and the other um, are in preparation. So we know exactly what to write. It's just a question of doing right now. So achieved results. So in the battery industry, you start first to design coin cells or so 18 millimeter small cells. And you can see here, Remembering this high energy density of, of over 1,000 milliampere hours per gram, we have achieved more than 1,000 milliampere hours per gram. And it, the reference is NMC811. It's here below. And, and, and we, we have now cycled over 50 cycles. So we are absolutely on the right track um, with uh, an aerial capacity of 8 milliampere hours per gram. So the next step will be that we build larger cells pouch cells now with a higher energy, with a higher ampere hours. Therefore, we built uh, in summer a larger wafer of 120 millimeter length. And you see here the, the microscope picture, um, the carbon nanotubes uh, percolation network linked together like nanowires around and around is the crystal of the sulfur. So, all this, what we have done, is based on Marek Slavik's, our co-founder's experience, and 10 years of hard work in different companies. So he started in Norway 10 years ago, where he built his first generation. Then he went to Switzerland, second generation. After eight years, when he had a concept against it, now it's the right time to found Theon. And this was two years ago. So when we started two years ago, we didn't start at zero, because we, we started with eight years of rich experience of, of Marek. 
yeah, who is behind the company from a board perspective? We have as main investor Lukas Gadowski. He is also invested heavily in the in the e-flight sector, like Autoflight, Archer, Volocopter, Zapata. Very supportive. And uh, a second person I want to mention here is our chairman of the board, also investor in our company. This is Dr. Gerhard Grommer, the former chairman of Siemens. So um, very, very rich uh, and experienced board we have together. And as advisors, we have Professor Jürgen Janek from the University of Gießen. He's a solid state battery expert. And this gives you a hint what is in our roadmap on electrolyte. And then we have on the engineering side, Frankie Zapata, um, who helps us to make disruptive concept on our equipment side. So the management is currently, is this Marek, uh, a blessed electrochemist, um, and me, the gray-haired experienced production guy. I have uh, um, run battery factories al already, and therefore I know how, how we, which steps we need to do to go from a lab to a pilot scale and then to a, to a gigafactory. We have signed uh, uh, the contract already with a CTO and a CFO, and we will publish these names in the next days. So how we want to go to the market? We will start with niche markets, uh, like, um, like the ro rockets. They, are, they need high energy density, very few cycle life, and they pay a lot of money. And that is important to, to gain experience in production with lower amount um, of cells, but high value cells. Then we go to EV tolls and last but not least to the EV market. And now we're coming to the nearly the last slide. So we have now two years of company life and we have done a lot of proof of concept, patents filed, large crystal wafer built. Now the, the next step is to, until the end of the year having the first power cell ready and then increase over the next years the capacity on cell side and in parallel to industrialize our technology and to bring it into a gigafactory. So we know that partnering is important. Partnering can accept, accelerate our project and therefore you are invited to, to join us as a partner. Let's discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much and very interesting and again, several new things and i really already can invite you speak again at our arrow uh in in april uh because i think um first i thought when i heard your presentation it's a little bit very detailed and very technical but on the other end i think you have to be with all the promises which had made with batteries you have to explain why you can believe in that your promises can come true so thank you very much very interesting and um, now, uh, I just got the information that our uh, the planned host uh, for this session, Mike Hirschberg from the VFS, he just came uh, out of the space to us uh, because he uh, is in California and uh, he had some issues with connecting. So Mike, uh, happy to have you here. I just let you introduce yourself a little bit, and then we ask, we'll ask together the Q&A for this session, if this is okay with the speakers. Great, okay. great. Can you okay. hear me okay? Yes, we hear you fine. Great, I have um, some slides I'll present so you can see the slides. Yes, see you. Wonderful, wonderful. So thank you, uh, Vili, for inviting me to speak again. It's always a pleasure. Um, I'm going to um, show just a few slides. I think it's much more interesting for the, the panel, so I'll keep my remarks uh, short. Uh, again, I'm Mike Hirschberg. I'm the executive director of the Vertical Flight Society, and I'll talk uh, a little bit about what VFS is. So we're an international professional society for people that are interested in or, or working on uh, vertical flight. Uh, so we have researchers uh, and innovators from around the world in industry, academia, and government uh, that are members of VFS. Um, Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics is a, is a key member of VFS, and we have uh, faculty and students at that university that are, uh, that are active in, in the society. We were founded almost 80 years ago as the American Helicopter Society, 
Uh, but we're, uh, from the beginning, we've been international and very interested in anything that takes off vertically. Uh, vertical takeoff and landing and, and hovering. Uh, so that's micro air, air vehicles, uh, small drones, large drones, helicopters, eVTOL, um, jet, jet VTOL. So anything that takes off and lands uh, vertically. And we're an educational society, so we're, we, we want people to know about the challenges. That, that was an excellent presentation uh, just before us, and those are the types of, of uh, detailed presentations that we have at our events, and, uh, and talks about the latest research on uh, vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see a computational fluid dynamics uh, flow, a, a computer simulation of the airflow, of the Joby S4. This was from, from August of 2015. So our members were presenting the detailed information about a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Uh, this is now seven years ago. We're all about learning and sharing information, sharing knowledge, uh, working to make better aircraft. And that's uh, safety and, and acceptability, uh, things like quieter, low noise, uh, low pollution, and uh, we, we want companies and governments to invest in research and development funding. And we provide scholarships for students. We, we provide educational opportunities uh, for students and professionals uh, and then try to encourage uh, more, more young people to be interested in, in vertical flight. And it's really about bringing together people from industry, academia and government from around the world. And if you're interested in, in VTOL, if you're interested in electric flight, uh, please join us. Uh, you can see our, our web uh, website address uh, there at the bottom, uh, vtol.org. Uh, that's vertical takeoff and landing.org. And that's been our web address since, uh, since we first started a, a, a website uh, when the internet was created in, uh, back in 1993. We have lots of technical resources. We have a, a nice magazine where we talk about the latest developments in, in aircraft. Uh, we have everything online. So if you join today, you can find magazine articles from 70 years ago. Uh, we have a, a, a detailed technical library um, with over uh, 15,000 PDFs um, with, the late, with uh, detailed technical uh, papers. And then we have a journal. So we have a technical journal of peer reviewed uh, scientific articles uh, on the latest cutting edge scientific and, uh, and technology um, breakthroughs. We have lots of online resources, uh, particularly for uh, eVTOL. We have been cataloging every single eVTOL concept that we can find. Uh, so as soon as there's a, a press release or an announcement or a presentation at a conference that we can find out about, uh, we create an entry so on our, in our database. So this is an encyclopedia of all the different concepts. Uh, and it's very interesting to, to see as, as designs evolve and, and improve um, or new designs are, are um, considered, uh, what, what, you know, how the concepts have, have evolved. Um, some companies like Volocopter first started flying in 2011, so that was uh, 11, 11 years ago. Uh, and we have, I think, about 10 or 12 different designs from Volocopter as they study different uh, configurations for the marketplace over that time. Uh, we have uh, different social media outlets uh, with, um, with news, uh, videos, uh, uh, lots of educational opportunities. And we have a free newsletter, so you can get uh, emailed uh, the latest information that we've uh, that we found from different publications and from our own our, uh, research and our own anal analysis. Um, and uh, we also have those archives. So if you uh, you can go to our website uh, evtal.news and find all of our past uh, and current newsletters. So I'm just going to talk briefly uh, before the panel. Uh, so there's, we see really five key challenges for eVTOL. There is the, uh, the technology itself, and it was an excellent presentation just now on batteries, uh, motors, uh, the, the individual components, and then bringing it all together in a, in a 
aircraft design and integrated configuration. And there's lots of uh, challenges with that, with supply chain, uh, the technology, making things very lightweight and, and powerful and, and reliable. And then there's the infrastructure. Uh, so that's landing pads, uh, vertiports. You see a concept on the, on the right-hand side for a very futuristic uh, uh, vertiport. Uh, and then there's the air traffic control or the unmanned or, uh, or UAM traffic management to control all these different aircrafts in a city. Uh, so this might be um, you know, hundreds of flights an hour uh, at, at one location. So that's well beyond what you could do with a manual with the existing type of air traffic uh, management. So all this needs to be you know, computer controlled and, and orchestrated. Uh, eventually, uh, the aircraft will be certified to fly autonomously, but in the beginning, uh, most aircraft, uh, most aircraft developers are planning to have uh, them piloted. Uh, in the US, we think it'll be probably be uh, five or maybe 10 years before aircraft can be certified as flying autonomously. Uh, EHANG has been flying their uh, uh, EH-216 or Advanced Air Vehicle. Uh, for many years, uh, about five years with people, and it's, uh, it's completely autonomous. Um, Ehang is certainly leading the way in that area. Uh, in the U.S., because of regulations, it'll be sometime, I think, before that will be approved. Uh, standards and regulations, uh, you know, we think that Ehang will be uh, certified in the next uh, several months, uh, and that'll be very exciting to have the world's first certified eVTOL aircraft. Uh, elsewhere, the other regulators are reviewing concepts, developing the rules and regulations to allow uh, aircraft to fly, and standards bodies are developing the standards. You know how uh, how safe uh, to make the aircraft, to make sure that not only are the people on board safe, but if it if it has an accident, that people uh, on the ground are not uh, hurt or killed. Uh, there are. Uh, uh, challenges with public acceptance. So there are there's uh, concerns. People are concerned about the safety. Uh, these aircraft will be much quieter than helicopters. Uh, but if there are hundreds flying uh, in your neighborhood over your house, uh, it, it creates something we call NIMBY, which is not in my backyard. That's great to have these aircraft. Uh, some people want it for convenience, but other people are not gonna to wanna to have hundreds or thousands of aircraft flying over their house every single day. So there's lots of developments with the aircraft, there's developments with the supply chain, the technologies, uh, the, the, um, the aircraft, and there's this first mover advantage that the first companies to market will establish a brand, uh, get more market share, share make, more, um, make more sales, uh, and then they'll have more um, they'll have a better place in the market. They're, they're hoping to, um, that the first movers, the first companies to, to reach certification will be the ones that, uh, that get the most sales. So thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to talk and I look forward to speaking on the, on the panel. Yes, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mike. And always when I see your presentation, I feel so bad because you promote uh, VFS so good uh, that I always think, oh shit, I should have promoted my own magazines more. And uh, no yes. problem. But uh, the, the great thing is that uh, you really bring people together. And that's what I want to mention, like uh, look at the VFS events if you want to get together with a community in United States, they are doing a, doing a very good job. And Mike and I, we work together over years for getting people over, getting over to China, getting over to Europe, because we both believe in that this is a worldwide project. EVTOL and electric flying is not something you can do in any uh, just so one single country. So and now we have Q and A's for the last session, and um, I'm sure uh, you have some probably on the battery. Um, I have one more question uh, on Christian Mundikla, which I noted, uh, who was our first speaker in the session. Uh, I noted that you mentioned that you have several test sites which we are ramping up. 
uh, you mentioned the ones in Austria. Uh, do you also have some test sites out of Austria or is everything what is on the test area uh, for FACC is done in Austria? Uh, correct. Second, uh, uh, we are active for Airlabs as a, uh, a founding member holding 18%. And the goal is to establish five test areas in Austria. And the first one, the biggest one, was uh, already approved uh, by uh, the Ministry of Climate, Technology, Innovation, Transport. So this is close to Vienna. Uh, Steinalpel is the name. Another one is Hochka and Frauschek, which is quite close. Uh, Red Bull is flying there. And uh, as well, our own uh, plant four area uh, where we can do also the test after the production, but not outside Austria, all are done inside Austria, but not, not heavily linked with FSCC. So anybody can approach Air Labs and uh, ask for a flying at one of those uh, five areas in the future. I meaning one is now approved. Uh, Hochka and, and FSCC shall be approved in the next weeks uh, from the ministry. So uh, FSCC does not necessarily uh, be um, involved in that. Uh, Air Labs, you can Google on homepage the, the around 70 services of Air Labs um, and, and ask for a test flight uh, in one of those test areas. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a, another question. As we are talking about test areas, I think this is probably one of the fields where Corvin with a Skyroads is also heavy involved because uh, if you want to test in a test area, it's not only that you want to test uh, the vehicle. We also have to test, I think, the uh, air traffic management system. So um, I heard from the DLR and from other uh, that in Europe, we have more than 30 different test centers at this point. Some of them only for small drones, but some of them like Kochstedt, like uh, others also for going for really large drones, manned and unmanned. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, do you have an overview uh, on the test structure? And uh, can you tell us where you're involved with your projects? Um, thank you, Willi. Yes. As um, as Christian just indicated, um, test fields are being prepared uh, throughout Europe right now. Um, most of you will be aware of the fact that in actual fact, today, um, a lot of eVTEL manufacturers end up in Spain mm -hmm. if they have to fly right now uh, for the very reason that they find large unobstructed areas there uh, with uh, manageable ground risks. And the challenge that we all have um, is to manage um, the, the air and ground risks that we create by testing aircraft um, as, as we move forward. And um, that, has, that has a number of aspects that need to be covered. Um, and to be quite sure, um, um, the, the, the projects that um, FACC is running are, are um, extremely valuable here. Um, also, the uh, Austro control um, is playing a very um, proactive role in, in creating these areas. Um, uh, we, from a German point of view, we're a little bit jealous sometimes of what um, Austro control is doing. They are a smaller and more flexible entity than the German um, ANSP is, the Deutsche Flugsicherung. Um, having said that, we have a lucky um, circumstance here in southern Germany because Austro Control, the Austrian ANSP, manages a number of South German airfields. And we're taking advantage of that and trying to create something very similar to what Austro Control is doing in Austria here in the German arena. And um, as, as some of you are aware, there is a, a well known experimental. Um, test airport in southern Germany called Oberpfaffenhofen, used to be the Dornier company airfield. Um, they are um, um, expanding um, their uh, test capabilities there. Um, but uh, to be honest, this is geared very much towards um, 
non-passenger carrying drones. And we are currently supporting together with Austro Control and um, the company Frequentis an effort to install a flight test area in the Augsburg area, so at northwest of Munich, um, which eventually will be able to um, accommodate heavy drones, many hundred kilogram drones, potentially passenger carrying drones in fairly congested areas in Central Europe, which would be quite unique. As, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, right now, um, there is a tendency for people to go to very sparsely populated areas in order to do their test flying. Uh, we have to get away from that because um, the, the involved cost for the manufacturers is enormous. Um, and the flexibility is reduced if, if people, if, if companies have to travel several thousand kilometers in order to flight test their vehicles. Um, so uh, what, what do we need in order to build up these flight test areas? Obviously it's physical infrastructure and um, uh, several um, Vertiport providers are involved in, in the different programs here in Central Europe to create these areas, but also there needs to be digital infrastructure. Basically, how do we guide vehicles um, safely and how do we manage the interoperability? In other words, how can different vehicle types fly at the same time? And again, that is, that is where we are involved. And obviously, really, uh, we are talking to all the, um, the parties that are interested here, the German Research Institute, DLR, but also, again, we're talking very, uh, we have involved talks with, with other um, players uh, from the European community. And uh, again, it's no secret that Austria is very, very proactive in getting there. And we're quite excited to be involved um, with companies like Frequentis and um, the uh, Austrian air traffic control um, organization. Uh, Willy? Yes. May, I... may, may I show, share quickly uh, the, the Steinalpel area? Yeah. I think it, it fits, if you don't mind. No, sure. So um... this was approved end of August uh, uh, by the uh, ministry. So it's around 7,500 feet above uh, mean sea level. Um, Steinalpel, we also have... Uh, operations, standard operations, frequency uh, 1 to 2, 0.175 megahertz. And uh, it's, uh, the topography is, uh, yeah, mountains, I would say. Uh, it's also uh, emergency response plan is there, like for uh, airports. And uh, yeah, uh, FIU and Neom, you can see here also the, um, the link. Uh, is, is, is using it already, uh, flying there with uh, their drone. Um, yeah, so I think this, these are quite new news, two days old. <laughs> um, so, no, thank you very much. And I think that's why we have a panel discussion that everybody can ask uh, to everybody. And also, I remember uh, the audience, we have some questions. And I also have uh, one question already here for Mike, but uh, as uh, you got up so early for our session, I would definitely also ask you uh, if you have questions to our panelists. You're muted, Mike. Can you unmute, Mike? Okay. Um, I don't have any uh, any questions for the panelists. Um, it's uh, I didn't get to see all the presentations, but it was... Uh, yes. Very interesting to see the, 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 the information about the test sites for sure. Weather, weather is, uh, you know, clear weather and um, large unpopulated areas is, is really important for uh, doing early test sites. Okay, there, maybe I can add something here because tomorrow morning we have actually a special session which is talking about this, which will, in the session we will have First, EASA, uh, David Solar, giving an overview of their latest updates from uh, the Rotor uh, or European Rotor show, where they always announce their news on the N uh, MOC. But uh, then we have on the test area, we have Kochstedt, which is last year in May, the, uh, the new um, uh, incentive of the German DLR. It's a test center where all the 
different 22 ELR institutes working together, supporting manufacturers. And it's also a little bit like you mentioned in Spain, it's a little bit in the middle of nowhere, but um, they have a lot of traffic. It's an old air, uh, airport uh, from the German De Democratic Republic, a large runway. So they can really have interactions with different kinds of air, uh, aircraft there, and they want to do this. Uh, so tomorrow morning, eight o'clock, stay tuned there. And later, the third speaker in this session will be Volocopter, who's probably one of the most active companies also performing flights in public which brings us back to this public acceptance thing. I've been in the last months at two of their ones. One was in Paris, the opening of the first vertiport in Paris for the Olympics 2022, uh, 2024. And uh, then in Kochstedt, they were performing some exercises with an unmanned drone and, a, and an ambulance helicopter for the avoidance of any uh, incest. So, uh, so there, really stay tuned. And uh, now I have one question for Florian on the simulator, uh, which is, um, I've seen the simulator now in two different locations, like in Cologne and one in, and in Munich. And I hope you'll bring it also to the Aero uh, next year. And I think, is this a simulator where you can when I understand right, you can feed in the flying characteristics of different eVTOLs. So it's not, a, let's say, a Joby simulator or a simulator for one special company. It's a simulator which you want to try out for different uh, flying characteristics of different eVTOLs. This is correct. And a very subtle uh, difference between Cologne and Munich. In Cologne, the simulator even had a different cockpit because basically um, the cockpit we had in Munich reflects our philosophy, which we would like to push, whereas in Cologne, it was uh, the cockpit uh, of another company customer that uh, wanted to have a collective. So you see that everything is very modular and that you can very quickly change it. And one of the main uh, things is now together with different manufacturers to discuss and find a consensus on operational concepts, which hopefully eventually also then have an influence on rulemaking. Because what currently happens, you to a certain extent need to have a standard for certification, right? But every company says, ah, we have the very best thing and it's so secret, we cannot tell you. And if every company is doing a very different operation where the reaction to a control inceptor movement is something completely different. How should you organize licenses? How should you organize flight training? And therefore it's clear to, uh, that it's needed to have a, a consensus. And so we are willing to put what we do on the table. And then of course, the hope is that the companies will see that uh, due to the requirement for regulation, it makes also sense if they open up a little bit so that a common best compromise can be found. Thank you. And uh, yeah, for uh, if you're more interested, especially in the simulation side, we will have a larger article in our eFly journal, which you see no, on the other side. Uh, on this side, uh, uh, our magazine, where which comes out on a regular basis, and we have this uh, eFly journal. The next one will come out after this eFlight forum for condensing all the information we get here in all the sessions. And so it definitely makes sense. It's for free. You can download it on the website eflightjournal.com. And um, so now I have one question, which I think is one of the key questions of how far our eVTOLs can fly when, or let's say it other way around, if your battery is going to work also for the aviation side, Uli. Will this be um, available for aviation uh, or when, when we will see the first samples flying? Yeah, that's a very good question, obviously, and the crucial question. Um, <laughs> we, it, it, we, we go step by step. In our first generation, as I explained, we're targeting 500 what hours per kg, 
which is significantly higher than state of the art and already already a game changer for the for the e aviation industry so in the next two years we will industrialize our our uh, product and the production and then having in um, 2025 a small scale production line up and running which is scalable into gigafactory so and by end of 25 beginning 26 we will have the the first cells in in significant uh, amounts available to hand over to um, eVTOL companies and then knowing that 500 watt hours is uh, is our target in in gen 1 you, you can imagine you you can then uh, expand your range by factor 2 yeah compared to what you have today okay thank you Can you get eFlight Journal? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com. Then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying, eVTOLs, and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen like a conventional magazine or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye.